Welcome everyone. I am Ari Engel, the Director of Creative Community for Peace. We hope everyone had a very happy Passover. Uh, Creative Community for Peace is a nonprofit entertainment industry organization comprised of prominent members of the entertainment community who have come together to promote the arts as a bridge to peace, to counter anti-Semitism within the entertainment industry, and to galvanize support against the cultural boycott of Israel. To learn about our work and to support our work, please visit ccfpeace.com. Dot com, that's ccfpeace.com or creativecommunityforpeace.com. Uh, we are glad to all uh, have all of you with us today in our public square and joining us for this installment of our Dispelling the Mist series, which is an educational series of conversations with some of the leading experts on the issues and challenges facing Israel and the Jewish people today. Uh, if you've missed any of our previous conversations, they can be found on our podcast and our YouTube pages. Just please visit our website for those links. Today, we're gonna to be discussing Israel and international law, something that is often very misunderstood, but often weaponized against the state of Israel. Uh, please feel free to leave questions in the Q&A section of the chat, and I will try to get to as many of them as possible towards the end of the discussion. Uh, we just ask that you please only post questions in the Q&A section. Uh, all other comments or ideas can always be emailed to us at info at creativecommunityforpeace.com. Uh, so in conversation with me today is Professor Eugene Kontorovich. Eugene is a professor at George Mason's Antonin Scalia School of Law and the director of its Center of International Law in the Middle East. Before coming to George Mason, he had been a professor at Northwestern University School of Law for 11 years. Uh, an expert in international and constitutional law, he has published over 30 academic articles in leading law review and peer reviewed journals. His scholarship has also been cited in many leading international law cases in the United States and abroad. Eugene is also the head of the International Law Department at the Kohelet Policy Forum, a Jerusalem-based think tank, and is recognized as one of the world's preeminent experts on international law and the Arab-Israeli conflict. A welcome, Professor. All right, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you for making time. Absolutely. So to get in it, because I know we're going to have a lot of questions uh, from the audience, but just to start to sort of set the table, people don't really understand what international law is. They hear people throwing it around as if there's some Congress for the world that has passed this body of law that every country must adhere to. So just for starters, can you briefly explain what is international law? Uh, I'd be happy to, uh, with the caveat that we spent about the first three weeks of my public right. law, international law <laughs> class on what is international law, does it exist? Um, briefly, international law is a set of rules that governs countries. Um, and so the question is, where do rules that govern states, which are themselves sovereign, where do they come from, because what's above states? Right. Um, and, and the answer is in the philosophy of international law, there's nothing above countries. Countries are the top level actors uh, in the global community, which means if there's a rule that governs states, since there's, nothing, there's no authority above states, um, the, uh, then it must come from countries themselves. So international law is rules that are agreed to by states. And briefly, they can agree to those rules in one of two ways. The principal way uh, is what you'd call contracts, which are treaties. So treaty, when a country signs a treaty, it agrees to a, a set of usually general rules that it's gonna govern its behavior in the future. And because it agreed, so long as it maintains that agreement, it's bound to the extent it agreed. Um, and another form of international law, sometimes you have contracts that are unwritten, which we call custom. But um, those are very hard to, to, to that's, a, that's a difficult to find because you have to have a clear consent by countries to be governed by rules. So let me just briefly say what's not international law. So that, that explanation might have, uh, might have been a bit vague, but it's very easy to say what's not international law. So resolutions of the General Assembly, uh, or broadly speaking, most actions of the United Nations are not international law. Why? because they're not one of the things I mentioned. They're not agreements by countries. The United Nations, when it acts, only has the powers given it to it by the, Uni by the United Nations Charter, which is a treaty. So the United Nations Charter gives the General Assembly the power to pass its own budget. It does a very fine job of that every year. Uh, but other than that, it doesn't have any power. So it's just, uh, it's just talk. Things international law professors say, just talk. So uh, most things that sound like international law are not, in fact, international law. International law is thin compared to most legal systems. Right. So is there anywhere where this is codified somewhere? For instance, the Red Cross puts out a document on customary international humanitarian law. Um, where So is there anything, is there any place people can go to like see this body of law? And how binding is even that document that the Red Cross puts out? 
So, so there's not one place to find it. So it's not like the US code, right? If you want to find out US law, you look to the US code. And if you want to find out what it means and how it's been interpreted, you look at the case reports and the federal register. Um, there's not one place. International law is what international law professors call fragmented. It's in a lot of uh, places. So for example, the law of war is found in a variety of treaties, such as the uh, Geneva Conventions, um, uh, but many in many other treaties. There's not one central uh, repository and there's no central um, authority. But I'll say one important thing, because we're talking uh, here to speak about Israel uh, in right. a sense, and I like that we haven't mentioned Israel yet. Um, that, that's great. Because when you're talking about international law and Israel, um, there's, uh, there's a few methodological points to, to understand. Usually when people are talking about international law when it comes to Israel, they speak about rules, which they've never heard about in any other context, and they speak confidently about what they mean. In this one very controversial case, the case, uh, the case of Israel. So here's a quick test for how, so what is it? So international law, again, what is law? Law is a general system of rules, right? Announced before you know the case at hand, right? You make the rules before you know the defendants and the plaintiffs. Um, and so what's international? Between countries. So it's rules that apply generally between countries. Uh, so if it just applies to Israel, if Israel is the only example, it's neither international nor it's law, nor right. is it law. So when you hear people make claims about international law, uh, say it's illegal for Jews to live in uh, places in Jerusalem. Say, can you give me another example of where it's illegal for an ethnic group to live in a particular place? Right. Now, if they're very clever, they'll actually have an answer to that, which is Jews in the Sinai, Jews in the Golan. Um, right. But okay, leave the Jews out of it. Is there another example? But, right. And uh, we can't find any. So generalizability is a crucial test. And this is not a question of whether there's a double standard or hypocrisy. It's much deeper than that. It's, is there a rule of law in the first place? Right, so before we get into specifics about Israel, which will be the bulk of the discussion, just because you hinted at the UN. So the General Assembly, as you mentioned, the resolutions are non-binding, does not create international law. What about the Security Council? Does that create international law or is that's it? A great, that's a great question. So the Security Council is not a source of international law. Again, sources of international law when countries agree to be bound. Now the Security Council has been given power by the UN Charter to make certain binding decisions. So the Security Council can um, make decisions to so-called redress breaches of international peace. So for example, they can authorize sanctions. Economic sanctions are often illegal or breaches of international trade law without some special circumstance. They can authorize even the use of military force, which might otherwise be uh, illegal. So they can authorize what I call remedies. Right? But that's not law, that's enforcement. So the Curious Security Council has certain enforcement powers for certain narrow violations of, um, of uh, international law principles, but they can't make international law. Right. They have to some, sometimes make their own interpretation, but it's not a lawmaking, it's not a, uh, it's not a court, it's not a legislature, uh, and it's not a form in which international law is, is made. Right, right. So discuss more specifics as it applies to Israel. People say Israel is an legal state, right? Since the General Assembly resolutions are not binding, as we just talked about in international law, what gave and what gives Israel legitimacy as a state under international law? Oh, that's a great question. So a lot of people like to say that actually the United Nations resolution um, recommending the partition of the uh, British mandate create, uh, created Jew, uh, Jew, Jewish and Arab state um, in some way created Israel. Um, it's simply historically uh, not true. Uh, the what um, that that was before the Israeli War of Independence, um, where the UN didn't really help Israel. So, but again, let, let's just apply the methodology I, I just spoke of. Um, you know what? Uh, uh, what gives South Sudan the right to exist? What gives Italy the right to exist? Uh, you know, um, what gives Ethiopia the right to exist? What gives any country? What gives Ukraine the right to exist? What gives Russia the Ukraine? The, so. Countries, you own this question of an international birth certificate or international permission to exist right. only is discussed in the case of Israel. Countries are typically created by the people there deciding to create a country, having a war with whoever wants to stop them, if, uh, if that's the situation, if it's not a peaceable Czech situation like the Czech Republic and, uh, uh, and Slovakia, and, um, and prevailing. Uh, so, so countries don't typically don't need uh, anyone's permission. Um, now, as it happens, Israel does have permission. Uh, 
but but that is neither necessary. Um, it's just not necessary. Uh, so the but the permission did not come from the United Nations. The permission came even from the predecessor of the United Nations, the League of Nations, in 1920 when they issued the San, uh, the San uh, San Remo Declaration, recognizing the idea of a Jewish national home in Palestine. Now it's actually important that it's the League of Nations because unlike the UN, so I mentioned the UN is created by a treaty. Countries create the UN. They give it its ver its powers, and those powers are nothing basically. The countries, when the League of Nations, it actually did have certain powers, including the um, deciding what's going to happen with the uh, former imperial territories of the defeated powers of World War One, uh, mm -hmm. Germany and, and Turkey, and that that's uh, that that is that that is what gave Israel its initial uh, basis for creation. But once a country is created, you don't look back. That is mm -hmm. to say, no country does the circumstances or sort of lineage matter. Once a country is created, every country has equal sovereign rights and an equal right to exist. Right. I mean, it's a member of the United Nations, is recognized by countries, it exists as a country, claiming that it's somehow illegal is just doesn't hold, doesn't hold up. As you said, it's sort of singling out Israel to a standard that no other state is being held to. Well, I'll tell you something very funny. Um, you know, one thing you're probably not going to have um, on campus is a um, a discussion of does Jordan have a right to exist? Right. Does Jordan exist? Jordan, they rule over a Palestinian, large po a Palestinian population. They have weird borders. But Jordan exists actually solely as a function of what I just mentioned, the League of Nations mandate for Palestine. Because right. the mandate for Palestine actually created two entities, Arab state, Jewish state, nothing like the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan ever existed in the globe, on the map, in anyone's imagination. But everyone assumes that that is valid. And so that, that shows that the League of Nations mandate is valid. And the only question that's raised about it, of course, is about the, right. the other side. Right. The Jewish right. So Sykes-Picot created Lebanon and Syria and Iraq and you know, Saudi Arabia. All these countries are created after World War I. And they are, the only one that is questioned for some reason is, uh, well, we know the reason, is the state of Israel. So to get in a couple more specifics, though. So under international law, uh, is there a right of refugees to return to the land they fled? Whether we're speaking about Israel or not Israel, just under international law, is there such such a right? Um, there is absolutely no. First of all, I want to say from the beginning, uh, the people who are called Palestinian refugees are not refugees in the normal sense of international law. Um, the Refugee Convention defines a refugee as someone who has fled their home during a um, time of war or persecution and uh, is unable to return. Uh, the uh, people who are called Palestinian refugees today are overwhelmingly, like 90 percent, not people who fled any uh, right. uh, any country, um, but uh, rather they are third generation descendants. Uh, typically, um, this is the so in international refugee status, there is no in, uh, hereditary statuses in international law. It's not a feudal system. Um, so basically, there's a special, unique definition of refugee uh, just for Palestinians, uh, and we're going to see that a lot. Special, uh, unique definitions. Um, so um, basically, they're not refugees, um, and uh, there is, you know, um, what it means a right to return. Uh, you know, there is a, a general. It's a good thing to allow refugees to um, to uh, return to their homes, and it is the goal uh, of mo uh, most um, war uh, post-war settlements. But it's not anything with a particular uh, remedy. Um, or, uh, or a particular formula, and is typically done in a kind of reciprocal fashion. So, right, there's typically refugees from both sides, uh, and both sides return. Um, but it's simply, uh, if it doesn't happen like uh, at the end of a conflict, it doesn't happen at all. Um, and there's no such thing as an intergenerational right of return. Right. Uh, and certainly, no one talks about Jewish refugees from Arab lands having a right of return. Um, because once they settle in Israel, they're not refugees anymore. Um, so basically, there's just not Palestinian refugees to speak of. Uh, just like speaking of Jewish refugees from Arab lands, it's a historical phenomenon. It's not an actual current refugee problem. Right. And so everybody also talks about war crimes. Like, what are war crimes? Because I think it's such like a misunderstood thing. And isn't in every war there's some sort of war crimes, I would assume, right? Um... Yeah, but like uh, when Western powers manage to have wars with, uh, let's say, uh, extra, uh, his, you know, a real minimum of uh, criminality by um, historical standards, when people accuse Israel of war crimes, what they're typically talking about is this idea of disproportionality. 
right? Mm -hmm. Look, the Palestinians have lots of casualties compared to the Israelis. Now, again, this is completely made up in the case you know, for Israel. So for example, consider America's war in Iraq. What were the American civilian casualties? Maybe zero, right? Right. Very, right. Small, yeah. very small, leaving, you know, leaving aside uh, civilian contractors, a complicated category. Iraqi casualties were obviously huge. Uh, and while you can question the propriety of particular attacks on, Iraq, on Iraqi targets, no one says that there needs to be a balance between the casualties. Take America's war in Libya. America killed maybe a few thousand people. Very well, very well, well fought war. What were the American civilian casualties? Zero. And then suggest America has to have civilian casualties in order to be uh, uh, to uh, conduct this uh, uh, this campaign. Um, so there's simply no idea of international law that the casualties of the two sides, let alone the civilian casualties, um, need to be uh, proportional. Right. Nor is there an idea that um, civilian casualties themselves create a war crime. The basic rule is you cannot target civilian objectives. You can only target military objectives. Right. What's a military objective? A headquarters, a command post, a training facility, a rocket base. Now, what happens if that military and international law actually requires combatants to separate their facilities, to put their military stuff away from their civilian stuff? If right. they don't, that's a war crime. So Hamas is committing like a, a lot of war crimes on this level. But let's say they don't. So let's say Hamas is committing a war crime and uh, intermingling uh, its military and civilian targets. Does that mean now Israel can't strike the military targets? Absolutely right. not. Absolutely. It, it means those civilian casualties become another war crime attributable uh, to Hamas. And the only proportionality international law requires is that civilian casualties, which are considered collateral damage, need to be proportionate to the military advantage. So right. in other words, it's not that it, it, if there's a uh, if there's one sniper in a school, maybe you can't target the school. If there's a, a headquarters or a rocket base in a school, then 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 it's a different question, uh, and it depends only on the prior judgment of the commanders, not on hindsight, which is always entirely different uh, in wartime. Mm -hmm. um, and and so these you know the the famous New York Times picture of all the. Uh, Dead Palestinian children, children right. about, about a third or a half of whom seem to have been killed by um, Palestinian misfires and Palestinian rocket, right. Hamas rockets that, uh, that fell short um, is uh, is entirely is entirely misleading because there's simply no rule that you must allow your own children to be killed because your enemy has decided to put their rocket launchers launchers in in civilian sites. Right. So it is a war crime for Hamas to fire these rockets from civilian areas or from schools and from as you know residential neighborhoods and buildings no absolutely and just like in for example american criminal law if someone takes a hostage like in a bank or in a hostage situation and the police when trying to you know uh get the bad guy he'll kill the hostage it's the hostage taker who's charged with that murder like that's right. just an additional crime attributable to the uh, right to the hostage taker right no that, that makes a lot of sense so sticking with hamas and sort of gaza is the Israeli blockade of Gaza illegal under international law? Oh, great question. Um, so blockade is the is is the fundamental legal tactic of naval warfare. There are two main treaties about naval warfare: the London Declaration of 1909 and the San, uh, the San Remo Declaration of uh, 1992, 1993, I believe. Uh, statements of the general law of naval warfare. And uh, what they clearly say is blockade. So for example, I was just looking at San Remo earlier today. I'm, I'm a boring guy. And uh, the, uh, is a methods of warfare. First one, blockade. Blockade is a method of warfare. There might technical rules that you have to adhere to. You have to announce the blockade. But a blockade against an enemy is inherently lawful. It's what war is about. Uh, it's what the Union did to the Confederacy. And you never heard, that, heard anyone say that's illegal. Blockade is actually maintained to. Uh, in our current times, um, Georgia blockades the separatist region of Abkhazia. No one's ever said that's, uh, that, uh, that's illegal. Um, and blockade is basically what naval warfare is, uh, is about. And in fact, Israel administers its blockade far more leniently than it's required to by international law. The various treaties actually prescribe how much stuff you need to let in, medical stuff, food stuff, and um, Israel's allows far far more than that minimum uh in not even right. close.
And, and didn't some UN report actually find that the blockade was legal or there was some sort of report? I'm just remembering. Uh, there was a report by uh, International Military Commission. Uh, Commission right, Military Trump. Commission. Uh, senior uh, generals from around, uh, from around the Western world, which is not surprising because blockade is, is just a well-known tactic. Right, right. Um, so talking about the Palestinian Authority, they're trying to have Israeli leaders tried by the International Criminal Court, the ICC. Uh, does the ICC have jurisdiction over Israel and Israeli leaders? And what sort of power does the ICC have even under international law? Um, the, okay, so, um, I'm just sorry, I was looking at the questions. Okay, so the International Criminal Court, just a word about it. So we said there's no general international court. Like there's not a court of international jurisdiction. Right. Um, like if someone gets into an accident with you in LA, you can take them to Los Angeles County Courthouse and it's gonna be a court of uh, state court of jurisdiction. International Criminal Court is created by a treaty, right? It's not a roving commission. Um, and it has jurisdiction over countries that agree to join it by the treaty. Israel did not join. America did not join. Right. Um, indeed, when you look at the countries who did join and did not join, being likely to be involved in military hostilities is the best predictor of countries that um, did not join. Um, so Israel is not a member, and thus the general principle would be the ICC doesn't have jurisdiction. The reason the ICC has decided it has jurisdiction is because Palestine joined, the, the state of Palestine. Uh, now, there's a problem. Palestine's not a state. Uh, and right. that's, I thought there's some questions about this. We can, uh, right. we can talk about this. But I like to say that the investigation against Israel is the only investigation of a non member state at the behest of a member that is not a state. No other situation like this. They haven't like accepted the Kurds as a state or the Sawaharis. Uh, right. or any one of the other uh, thousands of ethnic separatist groups of some level of territorial control around the world. Uh, so the, um, the Palestinians do not seem to meet the uh, criteria um, of statehood. Um, they claim they don't have a state. Right? That's why we need a two-state solution. The very premise of the need for a two-state solution is that they, in fact, do not have a, um, do not have a state. Um, and so the, uh, and even worse, the, the crimes that they allege, which principally consist of Jewish people living in homes, occur entirely in what's called Area C of the West Bank, which under the Oslo Accords, the Palestinians agreed with Israel is going to be under Israeli jurisdiction. Right. So they don't have jurisdiction to give the ICC. Right. So the basic principle of the ICC is a country joins and can give uh, jurisdiction over its territory. But there's no reason to think that Jerusalem is in the territory of the state of Palestine. Uh, and really what they're trying to do is use a sympathetic international form to try to determine their borders. Now, I just want to say a word about the ICC. Right. Palestine, the Palestinian strategy is to go to the ICC because people who don't do international criminal law, it sounds very impressive. The ICC said. Right. Now, so a few words about the ICC. The ICC has been around now for a bit over the, uh, 20 years. Um, it has convicted, I believe, around eight people. Maybe it's 10 now. They have a conviction rate of about 50%. In other words, if they were a prosecutor at the aforementioned Los Angeles County Courthouse, they'd be fired a long time ago. Uh, their principal cases against uh, important people have all collapsed. Uh, they have failed to uh, secure jurisdiction of any uh, meaningful leader of a non-free country. Um, and for the Palestinians, it's just a no-lose strategy. Uh, because we know the ICC has never su succeeded in bringing to justice members of dictatorial regimes or people who won't go along. Right. So the, the Palestinians for sure are not going to go along. Um, and in the end, it could just be used to delegitimize Israel. But I want to say one interesting thing about the ICC at this time, because uh, everyone's very interested in the issue of Russia and, uh, and Ukraine. Right. Um, and uh, today, if uh, you haven't always known that Russia was the bad guy, you're a bad guy. So I want to say the ICC is a bad guy. Um, because Russia, of course, did not occupy Ukraine last month or you know, last week. It occupied Ukraine in 2014 when it, invaded, when it invaded Crimea and Donbass. And the ICC began an investigation into war crimes in Crimea. And uh, by many accounts, uh, including some research I have done, uh, since 2014, several hundred thousand Russian people, civilians, have moved into Crimea. Uh, 
Right. And um, the ICC was asked to investigate settlement, the movement of settlers, Russian settlers into Crimea. And indeed it said, okay, we're actually gonna investigate. And they issue reports on their activities every year, the prosecutor. And she said, you know what, we're investigating. We're investigating whether, you know, this war crime right. settlers moving into Crimea. And uh, many people told me, you see, Eugene, it's not just about Israel. Russians can be settlers too. Finally, mm -hmm. two years ago, the ICC prosecutor announced that she was opening a formal investigation into Russian crimes in Crimea. And she listed all of the crimes she was investigating. Guess what? Something was missing, the right. settlers. Right. Because it's important to know there has never been any international criminal inquiry. No one has ever been prosecuted for, um, or let alone convicted of this supposed crime of moving somewhere in any situation in the world. Um, and uh, it's only significantly discussed in the context of Israel. So when someone tried to make this argument about uh, Russia into Ukraine, the prosecutor was like, no, 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 come on. You know, it's, you know, like, this is not like a right. general thing. And this goes back to our, uh, go, goes back to our, uh, our, uh, our earlier point that there's a large body of international rules that are discussed only in the context of Israel, principally theorized in the context of Israel, and only really have any reality in the context of Israel, which means whatever they are, they're not really international law. Right. So just as, I, mean, I guess that's a good way to start discussing the West Bank or Judea and Samaria and the people living there. So as you're discussing, um, you know, I guess with starting with the people that you're talking about and the settlers um, or people that call, they, they call them settlers, you know, they always say anybody that moves there, that's illegal under international law because you can't forcibly move people. But these people are willing, they're going there on their, their free, their, their own free will, right? So what does international law say about that? Because that's I mean, nobody, always brought up as one of the greatest. Nobody you know, knows what international law says. Uh, what do I mean by nobody knows? People only know what they say about the Jews. Because you mentioned there's a book, this in, uh, International Red Cross's Guide to State Practice Under International right. Law. It's a very impressive book. For every chat provision of the Geneva Conventions, the uh, Red Cross put together everything that has ever happened or has been said in international law on that subject. And on the question of settlers, people moving, let's say, into an occupied territory, or being moved into an occupied territory, they had 104 examples. 102 of them were about Israel, which is very, which was, so, you know, you could say maybe like, uh, maybe that's, uh, what else is there? Who else does this kind of stuff? Right. Um, so they did not mention Western Sahara, Northern Cyprus, Vietnam, Cambodia, um, right. America, Berlin, or many other examples. Right. But um, so we, we don't know what international law says because it doesn't say anything. Uh, there is, there, these rules do not exist outside of the context of Israel, but certainly the relevant provisions of the Geneva Convention that people talk about when they talk about settlers say the occupying right. power shall not deport or transfer people into right. occupied territory. That's why they're called settlements. What do I mean by that's why they're called settlements? Because usually in law, we call things by the language of the treaty, of, of the legal provision, right? We quote things by the right. legal provision. But if it were called, if they were called by the language of the legal provision, we'd have to say deportees and transferees. And we'd have to call the communities in which they live in deportation and transfer centers. And that would, of course, show the obvious lie. No one's been deported. No one's been transferred. What happened is this. In 1949, Jordan invaded Israel and occupied a large part of the territory, including significant sections of Jerusalem. From those areas, Jordan expelled every single Jew, ethnically cleansed. And they maintained a Juden Rhine regime for 19 years. Israel returns in, uh, 19 years later. And now international law is used to make sound better what is the mo a most illiberal argument, that the areas from which Jordan ethnically cleansed Jews must forever remain Yudin Rhine. And even when Israel, a Jewish state, comes to administer them, it must forcibly prevent or deter Jews, but I guess not Arabs, right. uh, from uh, moving into these areas and make their life difficult if, if they choose to make. There's no precedent for this. It's illiberal, and it does not comport with anything in international law. 
Right. So, so keeping with the land there, so just talking about the land, not the people that may live there, um, under international law, is this occupied land or is it disputed territory? What does international law say about that? Because that's another issue that comes up a lot. So I think it's quite clearly not occupied territory. And by the way, if it's not occupied territory, we don't come on to the question of the Geneva Conventions, which only applies. All this, all this language about settlers and or deportees and transfers only applies in the case of an occupation. Um, you can't occupy. So okay, let me give an example. Let me give an example. Take, uh, take Crimea, as Vladimir Putin did in 2014. Um, thank you. I know I'm speaking to an entertainment audience. I'm trying to be funny. Uh, the, uh, so in, uh, Vladimir Putin took Crimea in 2014. Um, now, let's say some kind of miracle is worked for the Ukrainians. And not only do they push back the current onslaught, but uh, which seems uh, quite, un uh, but like what seems currently unlikely, um, they actually kick Russia out of Ukraine, out of Crimea. Right now, now to be clear, there's no Ukrainians left. There are very few Ukrainians left in Crimea. Most of them are Russians, Russian-speaking, Russian settlers, uh, which is historically part of Russia. So let's say um, in a few years, Ukraine manages to dislodge Russia from Crimea. Right. Would we say because it has been ruled by Russia for so long, and the people there mostly want to be part of Russia and are ethnically Russian, that that Ukrainians can't move there? Right. That's crazy. Would we say that it's occupied by Ukraine? No, because you can't re you can't occupy territory that you are merely retaking or to which you have sovereign title. Um, when Israel retook uh, Jerusalem um, and the surrounding regions in 1967. It was retaking territory to which it had a legal claim. Because here's the basic, very quickly, how do you figure out what, what were Israel's borders when it was created in 1948? It was not the borders proposed by the UN General Assembly. That was a non-binding resolution. It wasn't accepted by the parties. Uh, right. It was never implemented. There's a basic rule. Again, what are the borders of any country? Why is Crimea part of Ukraine? Why, why, do, why do countries have the borders they do? When a new country is created, it has the borders of the previous top level administrative unit. And that's designed to prevent conflict, uncertainty, uh, and so forth. Um, it always makes some ethnic group unhappy, but check it out with Jordan, check it out with Iraq, and check it out with Ukraine. That's right. how borders happen, which means when Israel was created, it would have presumptive sovereignty over Judea and Samaria and Jerusalem. Those areas were occupied immediately by, um, by Jordan, but that does not in any way weaken uh, Israel's claim. In other words, Israel wasn't conquering someone else's territory in 67, so there was no occupation. Even if there was an occupation that started in 1967, that occupation would have ended the moment a peace treaty was signed with Jordan in 1994. And don't take my word for it, take the word of uh, Jimmy Carter's State Department legal advisor, uh, not known for his sympathy to the cause of Israel, who right. wrote in a memo in 1978, he concluded wrongly, in my opinion, that the West Bank was occupied at the time, but is at the moment there's a peace treaty with Jordan, that's over. Right. So essentially, the British mandate of Palestine was the last sort of recognized body after the Ottoman Empire disappeared. And that was the defined territory. So there was no agreement by either party. Everybody went to war. And so the land has been in flux and disputed since then. But the the land as a as an entity would be what the British mandate held, right? So the that, land that, that is in the West Bank right now is disputed essentially because the Palestinians never accepted a state, the Arabs never accepted a state. Jordan sort of owned this territory, but no one recognized it, and so it's sort of a, an ambiguous ambiguous at the moment, correct? Yeah, I mean, it's all ambiguous. I think Israel has a strong sovereign claim, claim to it. Right. Right. Disputed is not a legal Occupation is a legal term. Occupation has a technical meaning in international law, rules, how it starts, how it ends. Disputed is not an international legal status. It's just a character. It's just a, a, an adjective. It is, right. in fact, a disputed territory. There's a dispute about it. Right, right. So I guess that, talks, that brings us almost to the people living there. So the Palestinians living in Ramallah and Nablus and Janin. Um, the term occupation, as you were talking about, is a legal term. And, you know, occupations aren't necessarily they're illegal under international law. They are part of the law of armed conflict. There's actually things that you're supposed to, you know, rules of, uh, of what happens if you are occupying a people. So when people say that Israel occupation is illegal, uh, just talking about the people here, not the land, like what is the response to that? Yeah, so the, 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 and there's not such a thing as uh, illegal occupation. Uh, I mean, an illegal occupation would be an occupation not conducted according to the laws of occupation. Right. But I think more importantly, there's not an occupation. Um, 
even if there was one in 1967, there for sure cannot be, there is no situation in which you can have an occupation persist after a peace treaty. Take, for example, Afghanistan, as America did in 2003. Um, America invades, installs a new government of its own choosing, and maintains a large troop presence and conducts uh, military operations, often, you know, accidentally bombing weddings or whatever, uh, to its liking and without the prior consent of the Afghan government. Even though there's hundreds of thousands of American troops there, it's not an occupation. Why? Because they made peace with the new Afghan government that they installed. But uh, whether it's good or bad, whether that's a good rule or not, that's clearly the rule. You can't have occupation after uh, a peace treaty. So there, there simply is no state of, uh, of occupation. There's, I think, a state of political tension. There's a state of hostilities, certainly a state of real hostilities with Gaza. So essentially you're saying is when they signed the Oslo Accords, that was a treaty of sorts that maybe transferred it from an occupation of people to uh, a, a treaty and an agreement that outlines what the legal stature and structure is. So I'm not, no, no, that's cool. But I'm, I'm saying there was never an occupation. But even if you disagree with that, there for sure would not be an occupation, not the Oslo Accords, but the peace treaty with Jordan. Because an occupation can only result in a war between two countries. So you can't have an occupation in what's called a non-international armed conflict. Right. Like when Iranian Revolutionary Guards kick out some uh, Shia, in uh, some Sunnis, pardon, in uh, um, Syria and replace them with Shia, it's not considered occupation or settlers because it's considered a civil war, a non-international right. armed conflict. You need a war between countries. When the war right. between countries is over, you close the Fourth Geneva Convention and, uh, and you're done. Right, because there was never a war. The, the Palestinians were never a state. They were never a country. This war was between Jordanians and the surrounding well, and, Arab and countries. That's, that's and the, like the, conventional, right, the conventional claim is that it was the war between Jordan, which triggered the right. in, Geneva Conventions in that territory. Right, right. So, but, and then talking about the military courts, just to dig a little bit deeper in this, um, you know, so so what what law does Israel apply when it is you know brings people from the the territories to the courts? Is that their own military rule? Is it Ottoman law that applies? Like what sort of is it Jordanian law? Like what sort of law applies and how is that applied? Uh, there is Israeli military law, which is you know fairly standard in its definition of crimes. It, it's shocking, I think, by American standards in its um, leniency of of, uh, of sentences. Um, but uh, the West Bank, you know, Israel does not have a civilian government uh, in the West Bank. Um, I think that's a great tragedy, uh, which has been imposed upon it by um, the West. That is to say, what's it mean that Israel doesn't have a civilian? Israel has a military government as an alternative to a civilian government. What's the civilian government mean? Applying Israeli law, just extending Israeli law to these areas and making it part of Israel. Now, it's hard to blame Israel for not doing it. Because when was because Israel did do that once, right? In 1981, when Israel, 1967, pardon, when um, Israel uh, applied Israeli law to Jerusalem. And then in 1981, when they passed the basic law saying Jerusalem is forever part of, uh, part of Israel, what was the international community's response? What was the international community's response when Israel extended its law to the Golan and gave the Druze there uh, an option of Israeli citizenship? It wasn't say, oh, thank you. Now you have like one system for everyone. It was to you know, call for sanctions, pull embassies out of Jerusalem. So I think that certainly in Area C, uh, under Israeli civil law, Israel should end the system of military courts and just apply Israeli civil law to, to everyone. But you know, unless you're prepared to accept that in all its implications, it's hard to criticize Israel. But it's interesting you bring up military courts because um, there was just an article in Haaretz today, which uh, was amazing. Again. When people write about Israel, they count on you not knowing anything else about it, the rest of the world or anything. Right. They say 90% conviction rate of Palestinians tried in these courts. 90%. Right. So th these, guys, th th these guys must be like uh, liberal do-gooder prosecutors. In America, standard conviction rate, uh, for a the average conviction rate for a federal prosecutor, 99.6%. Right. Uh, so in other words, you're 10 times better off as a defendant in an Israeli military court, as a Palestinian defendant in an Israeli military court, than you are as a criminal in a defendant in an American, uh, in an American court. But um, these claims only make sense, you know, like many claims of Israel only make sense in a complete absence of context. Right, right, right.
Um, so let's discuss the apartheid lie. You wrote in an essay that apartheid isn't just an absurd epithet when applied to Israel, it's also patently untrue according to international law, which is why exposing the Karnard on legal grounds is both easy and vital for coexistence in the Middle East. Can you just discuss what you were talking about there and, and, and that implication of international law in this context? Um, yeah, so uh, apartheid is uh, a crime in international law. Um, again, it's very hard to know what, what this crime really means because it's based, as its name suggests, on the practices, the very unique and distinctive practices of uh, the South African re regime from 1948 uh, into the 90s. Uh, South Africa adopted very openly, like this was a public thing, a system that they called apartheid, uh, which uh, was based on apartness, which uh, involved a denial, complete denial of political rights uh, and complete social separation. Uh, for all blacks uh, and, and coloreds. And basically, that's exactly what you don't have in Israel. Not in Israel, not in the territories. There are no spaces reserved for Jews. Uh, Jews and Arabs mingle uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in public places. Uh, and of course, I mean, today, there's only one country in the Middle East with a Muslim Brotherhood party in the government. Right? And it's not Egypt, and it's not Jordan, uh, and it's certainly not the United Arab Emirates, it's, it's, it's Israel. Uh, and it's not some kind of facade. It, it truly holds the, uh, the keys of power. Um, so in other words, there is simply no separation. But it's not just a lie, it's a big lie. Because it's not just not the truth, it's like the opposite of truth. Israel's a very integrated country. Uh, but it's the opposite of truth in another way. If you look right next door, right, if you want to find the you know, things that look like apartheid, Right. Just look at all of the areas under Palestinian control. So under Israel, every area under Israel control, there's some mix of Jews and Arabs. Holy sites are open to all people. Muslim can go pray at the Western Wall, absolutely no problem. No one asks, no one checks, no one looks. Uh, you know, you can come with shoes, you can come without shoes. Right. Um, the, but in all of the areas under Palestinian control are completely Jew-free, with the possible exception of the Haaretz reporter Amir Haas, that there are no Jews uh, living in uh, Palestinian territories, not because they don't want to, not because you know it doesn't have some historical meaning, but because they have laws about it. Jews can't buy land, just right. Jews can't own property, death penalty for selling land to Jews. So, so if you want to look for apartheid, um, you know, it, 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 it's not hard to find. And, it's, you know, and the fact that you know, Amnesty International can write a 200 page report about apartheid in the region and not mention a single one of those policies suggests it wasn't really, um, you know, it's a, you know, like, like the, what are the, the drunk man looking for his keys under the lamppost, because that's where the light is. They're not really looking. Right, right, right. And it's, it, and, and even the definition of, we've discussed in previous session of apartheid is sort of uh, undefined itself. And it seems like these NGOs are sort of trying to formulate it around the context of Israel which probably can fit a million other states much more easily exactly. than Israel. Exactly. Again, by the way, this is not the first time that they paint, that they, they throw the dart at Israel and then paint the target. For right. example, there's a definition of occupation in international law, which is the area has to be actually under the control of a military and the occupation ends when the soldiers leave and stop running the government. So after Israel left Gaza, right. the international community was like scratching its head how can we now say it's an occupation if they left? So right. they had a meeting, you know, the International Committee of the Red Cross had a meeting of experts, and they said, you cannot have a remote occupation, like an occupation from far away. You have to be there. You need boots on the ground for an occupation, except unless you previously controlled the territory for 45 years, maintain <laughs> a naval blockade, and right. engage in whatever other, other facts highly specific to Israel. Right. Uh, so it would not be the first time. Right. So it became very public. So to them, what is Gaza? It's not an occupation, but maybe it's apartheid. But well, there's no Jews there. They don't no, they say it's all. They say it's apartheid and it's right. occupation. It could be, it could be right. So it's everything. It's genocide. It's ethnic cleansing. If it's, if, it, if it's Israel, the definition, as you said, that's, I think that's beautifully stated. They throw the dart, then they paint the target afterwards and try to make no, it. No, also, the, other, the other famous example from this is the uh, is is uh, is an NGO had a paper NGO an academic I don't remember um, about Israeli occupation of Gaza and they found very distressingly that there were no reports of Israeli soldiers raping anybody in Gaza 
And they said, that's, that's un, un, extraordinary by historical standards. You cannot have a, soldiers in so, uh, uh, an area like this for so long without any reports of sexual abuse. It shows how racist they are against the Palestinians. So again, they come to the conclusion first, and then they like make an awkward reasoning back. Right, right. All right, so just to go to some audience questions here, um, here's one. What do you say to those who claim that the Israeli nation state law is racist, it upholds apartheid, and contravenes international law? What's the response? Um, okay, so uh, first of all, I have an article in Israel Studies about this. Um, an ex academic article with many examples, uh, which I would recommend to you. Um, and um, just if you want a longer response than I can get here, and uh, an article with my um, colleague Moshe Capel in uh, Tablet, um, no, in Mosaic, in Mosaic from uh, several years ago, uh, laying out the argument um, somewhat briefer, more briefly. Um, so uh, just to give you a summary of my argument, I would say the Spanish constitution, the Greek constitution, the Latvian constitution, the Irish constitution. In short, the provisions of the Israeli nation state law. Again, if you, you, know, you can only say it's racist or bad if you don't know about other things because um, et nation, national identity or group identity provisions are very common in Western constitutions. So what's, the, what's it do? It says it's the nation state of the Jewish people. Numerous Western constitutions have provisions saying exactly that. Um, it has Hebrew as the uh, uh, primary official language. Pretty much every country in the world only has one primary language, and it's not because they only have one ethnic group. So um, even countries with strong ethnic conflict have one, uh, have one, um, uh, one official language. Right. Um, indeed, Israel, you know, unlike many European countries, does not have a... So there's many ways you can express national identity in a constitution. So one way is with a, say, a, a secular way would be like a secular, I'd say modern way, would be an, a nation state provision. So that's what new constitutions in post-Soviet countries like the Baltic countries do. But another more old fashioned way would be to have an official religion, right? So Spain, Greece, say the, the official religion of the, and it's usually something national, the Greek Orthodox church, uh, you know, uh, the Norwegian Lutheran church, the Dutch reformed church. Uh, and that's the official church supported by the government. And then, of course, another way is to embody it in a particular person, like the King of Holland, um, you know, the, uh, the King of Norway. And in the constitutions of these countries, to be the head of state of those countries, you have to be descended, male typically, uh, from like a particular family, which I guarantee you is never Muslim uh, uh, or uh, of color. Um, and in Israel, who can be the head of state? Anyone. Arab can be the president of Israel. Arab has been acting president of Israel. Um, once when Shimon Peres, I believe, was um, like sick, um, and it was a it was a non it was a non event. So so these kind of provisions are absolutely ubiquitous. And again, I've never heard anyone say that the pa that Palestine is an apartheid state or has a apartheid nation state law, even though the Palestinian Constitution um, says that it is an Arab state. Right. Arabic is the only official language, Jew and Hebrew has no status, right. um, and, uh, and uh, it, Islam, is, Islam is the official religion. Uh, right. It's quite striking that Israel is the world's only Jewish country and still does not have Judaism as an official religion, whereas pretty much every kind of uh, Christian denomination and uh, Muslim sect is an official religion somewhere. Right, right. I think it, to many in America, they don't understand that for instance, is Europe. Europe, it's, I don't think it's seen as anything very striking, this nation state law, because they are nation states. And Americans, I don't think, necessarily comprehend that there most of the world is made of up of nation states. Right. The, the different kinds of models. First, America is not an ethnic nation state. America, right. Canada uh, are uh, pan-ethnic pan uh, large countries. Uh, but that's not the case for lots of other countries, both in Europe and uh, throughout, throughout the rest of the world, certainly in the Middle East. Right, right. Um, so another question here. What do you say about the, this argument? Is Israel annexed East Jerusalem, but no one recognizes that, or not many countries recognize that. Um, so you have, according to the other side, uh, a military occupation in East Jerusalem, and then the demolishing of civil property, saying Sheikh Jarrah, um, not for any specific military purpose. Is this a violation of international law, the, the demolitions? So first of all, the United States does recognize all of Jerusalem as being part of Israel. But, uh, that's quite clear when America, when Congress voted to recognize Jerusalem, 
they didn't say like part of Jerusalem. And when the United States finally moved the embassy, uh, which has now been maintained across uh, administrations, the embassy itself is actually across the Green Line. Uh, some people might not realize that, but the embassy is not in the uh, area of Jerusalem controlled by Israel before 1967. So I guess the embassy is now part of the uh, occupation. Um, the, um, and there simply is no military administration in Jerusalem. Right? Jerusalem is under civilian law, uh, governed by the same courts that govern everything else in Jerusalem. And also there's no demolition in Sheikh Jarrah. The dispute in Sheikh Jarrah is, there is one property that is actually uh, slated to be uh, 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 demolished. But most of the disputes that you hear about in Sheikh Jarrah are just property ownership disputes. That is to say, well, they're not actually property ownership disputes. Ownership is undisputed. There are people who are squatting on properties that are owned by Jews. And the argument of the uh, parts of the international community is Jews should not be able to exercise their property rights in Jerusalem because they don't like the political implications. I think this argument would be repugnant anywhere else. Imagine a minority, you know, there's a, 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 a minority moves into a neighborhood with a different ethnic configuration and buys houses to say, no, you shouldn't let them move in. It breeds conflict. That's repugnant. I think we're like 60 years past that. Um, so the property rights are undisputed. The only question is, should Jews be denied property rights? Uh, by the way, Israeli courts also, um, I actually have a student who is a prosecutor involved, an Arab uh, student who's involved in a, as a prosecutor in these matters. Uh, there's also disputes between Arabs in Eastern Jerusalem, like Arab property disputes in Sheikh Jarrah, because all of the titles are so poorly documented. They're implemented by the Israeli courts. Israeli courts are kicking out Arab squatters from other Arab property owners all the time. No one, doubt, no one doubts that that's okay. No, there's no objection. So the only question is, should Jews be treated the same? Also, there's no, and there's no problem with, with demolishing properties. Uh, there's zoning issues, there's property, private property issues, and you simply can't build up, you know, structures on somebody else's land. It's not a question of military law. Right. Um, so here's a couple of qu other quick questions, because um, we're almost out of time. Uh, someone's talking about Hamas controls, it, they're talking about in Gaza, they basically are saying that Gaza is such a crowded residential area as a whole, um, you know, do they have legit location from which they actually could fire rockets? Yes, from? Oh, first of all, go to Google Maps, look at Gaza, they got beaches, they got open areas, um, all of the areas of the former Jewish communities, you know, are like available to them for, I don't know what they do, I think they build villas or something, but they're certainly not housing um, people in there. Gaza is no more dense than many European cities, and um, right. no one has ever thought that European militaries are allowed to co-locate uh, rocket launchers in, uh, in, uh, in apartment buildings. Um, you know, the, this notion that Gaza is like a unusually dense is, is mistaken. Um, the, the Gaza is heavily urbanized, like many places. So like people live in big crowded apartments, but there's plenty of places around those um, big, uh, uh, big crowded uh, apartments. And in any case, it's their obligation to come up with a solution, not Israel's to respond. Right. I know. But I think there's also a. I think there's also a myth that Gaza is the most densely populated place in the world. Um, I, I don't know where. It, it sounds nice, I guess, to the anti-Israel community, but it's it's simply not true as well. Uh, yeah, that's yes. There's there are open areas in Gaza. Um, they have done. Uh, there are plenty of open areas. Gaza is like um, regularly dense. Israel is actually one of the is one of the denser countries in the world also. Um, so the. Um, it's dense, but not uniquely so. Egypt is very, the, the Cairo, Cairo is very dense. Right. Um, but it's a heavily urbanized population, which means people live tightly packed in in cities, but if there's open land around them, people just don't want to live there. Right. Um, another one here is since, uh, you know, Pal Israel entered the Oslo Accords, the Palestinians control territory in Area A. The UN is, is, has recognized them with some special observer status. So under international law, does now Palestine exist as a state or no? Uh, wait, what, what was the uh, what was the predicate to the question? What was the first I think part? they're talking about if Palestine does actually exist as a state, and they're saying because they have you know UN observer status, and then also that you know Israel has uh, given territory to them to control under Oslo, where they control areas A. Um, and then I guess also in Gaza, they moved out and uh, given now Hamas used to be the Palestinian Authority control over, over Gaza. So does that equal a state? Right. So it's an interesting question. Um, so let's just break it up into the parts. Uh, UN observer status doesn't mean anything. 
you know, the UN had a vote where they said, you know, the Palestinians are a state, have a state, the pa Palestine is a state, and because they don't have a state, they should be given a state. And we're going to call them a state so that you should understand that they need to have a state. So that's not normally how statehood works. Statehood is an objective thing. Uh, no one, there's no such thing as a state because you should have one. So you either have a state or not. So maybe the Kurds should have a state, but right. that doesn't affect the question of whether they in fact have one or not. And the UN actually does not, isn't, doesn't have the power to create states. Um, right. And they didn't even say the Palestinians have one. They said they do have one, but they don't have one. It was kind of a bit of both ways thing. Um, so what about Oslo? Oslo is interesting. So Oslo specifically does not create a Palestinian state. It specifically says it's creating a, a administrative authority, right. uh, which does not have sovereignty. Uh, and any, any what's called final status issues, such as whether there would be statehood, uh, are uh, completely taken off uh, the table. But then, and I think this point about Area A in Gaza is, is interesting, because it's true, the Palestinians have full control in Area A. Right. And even in most of the West Bank, Area B, 90% of Palestinians live under Palestinian control. That's a crucial point. Israel is not governing the Palestinians right. for most practical purposes. Like when we say, you know, people, you know, we need to vote. We need, everyone needs to, why do we need to vote? What, because no taxation without representation, right? That's the motto, right? Mm -hmm. Vote because the government taxes us or does things to us. And so we should have a say. Israel doesn't tax the Palestinians anywhere. Israel does not make the laws under which they live. Israel does not write their um, suicide bomber, uh, Mickey Mouse uh, educational materials. Um, Israel does not pa pass their legislation like pay for slay, uh, obviously. They're governed by the Palestinian Authority. Now, certainly in Gaza, which is a discrete territory, Area A is complicated because it's not a discrete territory. But certainly in Gaza, the Palestinians could have a very strong claim for statehood in Gaza. Gaza, I actually think, meets the criteria for statehood. So if the Palestinians say, we have a Palestinian state in Gaza, or even we have a Palestinian state in Gaza in Area A, they would have a very serious claim. But they right. don't make that claim, which right. is amazing because there are so many ethnic groups that want a state that right. sort of what I would call pre-claim, right? Like right. the Kurds would say, they don't have a state yet, but they're like, we're declaring our state. We're Catalonia. So we're right. declaring a state. And like, guys, you haven't like actually won. You haven't done the work yet. Right. Um, and uh, so there's so many self-declared People's Republic of this and that, which are in fact not states. Here, they actually have de facto sovereignty, right. but they don't want to invoke it because they want to, at the same time, claim oppression right. to leverage for greater territory. Right. And in the end of the day, I guess is a good concluding one, the, the real dispute between Israel and the Palestinians, it's not a sovereignty dispute. It's not a control dispute. It's not who controls the Palestinians. We know who controls the Palestinians. Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. Right. It's about territory. It's about right. how much land the Palestinians get. And the Palestinians are very savvy, at, on one hand, claiming the benefits of statehood when it helps them, like when applying to the ICC. On the other hand, uh, you know... Uh, when they're crying, fighting COVID, they're not a state, right? <laughs> crying, or, for, or in general, for trying to uh, delegitimize Israel, uh, right. crying oppression, crying, uh, uh, crying orphan, uh, help us out, we're, we're not a state. But not accepting statehood when they could, in order to apparently magnify their apparent suffering, uh, in order to be able to, for them to leverage their demands uh, better. I mean, it's, it, I think it's just right. a good strategy. It's a really interesting point, but I think it's it's a combination of infighting where the Palestinian Authority would never allow Hamas to declare a state and Palestinian infighting. And I think the second point is that because they want all of the land between the river and the sea and accepting any sort of state uh, in Gaza you know, is unacceptable to them because that is not their aim. Their aim isn't to get, you know, Gaza and the West Bank. It's to get all the land between the river and the sea. Um, so anyhow, we're at times. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you. Um, next week, we turn to uh, Back to America, where we discuss the anti-Jewish campaign of Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. Um, before we go, Professor, where can people find you on social media? Where right, can they you. learn more about your work? Uh, so um, on Twitter uh, is my primary platform, E V Kantorovich, like E V K O N T O R O V I C H. Um, you can just Google my articles, uh, and if you're interested in uh, what I've written on most of these subjects, um, I write often for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, but just drop me a, a line um, on email, I'm easy to find, or on Twitter, uh, and I'm happy to send you whatever's on the subject.
Great. So everybody else, please make sure to sign up for all of our conversations. You can donate. You can find about our work at ccfpeace.com. That is ccfpeace.com. We hope to see everybody at our future events. Please stay safe. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Great discussion. Take care.